Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Innovation is at the core of what we do at Nirex, and today's webinar is a very good example of that. Um, as a device manufacturer, we have to think into the future. We have to understand what researchers are doing, but also what they will want to do in a couple of years. The hyperscanning application that we are talking about today is based on the Neosport 2 device, which was released in 2018. This means that close to three years later, we continue to push boundaries of what is possible. So let's dig into this topic and its great features. Um, before I start this webinar, I would like to introduce myself and, and my colleagues. Um, the webinar will be, will be given by Blanca, who is leading our technical support team in the Berlin office. Um, I also work in our Berlin office. I'm a scientific consultant. And in the background, we have Amy, who has been helping us to organize this webinar, who will also uh, collect your questions. So a few considerations before we start the webinar. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, uh, but you will be muted for this webinar. If you have any questions, uh, please use the questions panel in the, in the GoToWebinar screen. Uh, this webinar is being recorded like all of our other webinars, and it will be available on our website in a couple of days. Um, if you have questions later on, if we missed anything, we'll try to cover as much as we can. But if we were not able to, please do write to us and we will get in touch with you um, offline. And with that being said, let's invite Blanca to talk about the setup of single device hyperscanning. Thank you, Maripa. Um, I will show my screen. Uh, do you see my presentation? Yes, I do. Ah, great. Um, Yes, yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, as Maple has said, uh, today we want to talk about hyperscanning and more specifically about our uh, newest feature on Aurora 2021.4, uh, uh, which is a single device hyperscanning. Uh, more specifically, today in today's agenda, there is uh, we're going to cover a few topics. Uh, first of all, what is hyperscanning in general? Uh, why would we want to use it? Um, and then we'll focus on um, first how to do this hyperscanning in general in NIREX devices and also uh, specifically using the NIRSPORT 2 and Aurora 2021.4. Um, then we'll see a, a brief demo that we, we did uh, using a, a real case, uh, trying to recreate a, a real paper. And uh, then Maipal will jump in to explain us um, a few usage cases and why, uh, what can we do with this uh, hyperscanning. Um, but so to start with, um, recent advanc advances in non-invasive brain activity measurement techniques have inspired social neuroscientists to simultaneously record data from two or more brains and investigate interpersonal um, across brains uh, neural correlates in various social, social situations. While this has been attempted decades ago in EEG studies, um, scanning two people at once uh, was later termed a hyperscan, a hyperscan in the work of uh, Montague uh, et al. at the uh, early uh, 2000s, um, where they connected uh, two functional magnetic resonance imaging scanners together, and then uh, they recorded uh, the hemodynamic data from two participants while they were playing um, a deception game. Um, the first hyperscanning FNews study was conducted by uh, Funane et al., this paper, in 2011. And uh, it used a simple tapping synchronization task to investigate the coherence uh, of neural activity between two brains. Since then, many researchers have uh, adopted hyperscanning FNIRs in various types of paradigms to study social interactions. In contrast to uh, classic experimental paradigms that measure brain activity of single participants during a social interaction, uh, simultaneously measuring the brain activity of several uh, interacting participants allows for the investigation of intra and inter brain neural relations. The hyperscanning techniques thus um, offer a new approach to account for the complexity of a, of a joint action. Uh, let's say the, the spontaneity, the reciprocity, and even the multi multimodality, which cons constitutes a big challenge for um, the neuroscientific examination. Um, 
Even though many articles have been published so far with EEG or fMRI hyperscanning, these modalities um, technically restrict the natural behavior that occurs during person-to-person -person social interaction. For example, eye contact, uh, gaze control, conversation, or, or more, even muscle memories for facial expressions and, and core, are core components of interpersonal communication. However, uh, these behaviors often generate uh, severe, severe artifacts um, in EEG and fMRI data. So because of the tolerance of limited uh, body movement, FNIR's hyperscanning allows researchers to investigate life interpersonal interaction with some degree of the behaviors that uh, were mentioned above. Um, in addition, FNIRS does not require participants to be connected to a scanner, which enables neuroimaging um, data collection during interpersonal interactions in a more um, ecologically valid environment. So we can resemble uh, real life situations. Here in this slide, um, you might see some examples of, of these, um, these real life examples. Um, and what do we do with the, with the data that comes out of uh, the hyperscanning? Um, the analysis and interpretation of hyperscanning data is a challenging task. First, an intrabrain type of analysis has to be adjusted to interbrain data. Or alternatively, of course, new, new types of analysis have to be uh, developed. And secondly, it is challenging to separate interbrain relations related to identical stimuli presented to, to both participants from relations that represent uh, between brain networks. For the case of, of correlation, this involves um, the calculation of partial or semi-partial correlation coefficients, but similar adjustments might be done to might need to be done to other measurements. Overall, this is a demanding topic and it requires precise specification of the scientific question addressed. Um, the types of analysis applied to hyperscanning data can be separated into different categories. Um, there are various uh, coupling or connectivity measures. Uh, which study the coherence uh, to estimate between brain couplings. For example, uh, the wavelet transform coherence is a, is a very common technique in, in FNIRS. Um, then we have the correlation and dependence analysis, which estimate the correlation between signals coming from two brains. Also, brain, uh, between brain networks can be uh, quantified with graph theory measures, which is very common on, on EEG and focus on, on different aspects like uh, measures like mod modularity, small, small worldness, and uh, directionality. And uh, finally, the, the analysis of information flow from one, from one brain to, to another, instead of focusing on synchrony, similarity, or network properties. Metho methods that are um, used to determine such a, like causal links are, are for example, Granger causality. Um, one brief note is that uh, we, will, we will not cover uh, analysis of hyperscanning data today. We have some planned webinars um, in the upcoming months uh, that will cover this specific uh, topic, but today we'll focus on the, on, the, on the technical setup, like how to get ready for the experiment and um, what to do with the, with the software. In the meantime, however, uh, we have in our NIREX Hub, Hub Center, um, in the, under the documentation section, some guides and tutorials and even videos from previous uh, webinars that talk about uh, functional connectivity in general. So they, um, they, I know they are partially covering uh, hyperscanning. So um, to get into more of a hands-on uh, part of this webinar, how do we do hyperscanning with NIREX devices? Um, it will depend on the device you have. Uh, if you have a NIR Scout or a NIR Sport 1 device, uh, you will be using NIRSTAR. So NIRSTAR offers a hyperscanning mode to study functional uh, neurovascular activation on two people simultaneously. Um, this hyperscanning mode uh, is accessible in the channel setup tab, what we see in this screenshot, uh, under the, the hardware configuration uh, GUI. Um, the constraint we have in here, so hyperscanning mode in Nearstar requires that uh, the detector bundle or the source bundle uh, are not split between subjects. So um, the smallest instrument uh, configuration that uh, allows for hyperscanning in Nearstar, in Nearstar sorry, is a 16 sources, eight detectors instrument. Um, this means that if you have, for example, an eSport one, which only allows for eight sources, eight detectors, uh, to do hyperscanning, you might need uh, to connect two, um, two eSport ones uh, simultaneously. Um, if this uh, perform, so basically in this channel setup uh, tab, what you need to enable is the perform hyperscanning checkbox after you have loaded uh, your chosen montage. 
um, then you can, uh, of course, um, select different uh, uh, features for uh, first subject and second subject. And once this uh, checkbox is enabled, um, you can uh, see how uh, this uh, hyperscanning um, tab will be uh, turned green. So we'll be able to see uh, a 3D display as a, as a standalone uh, GUI, uh, which will basically plot um, our hemoglobin concentration uh, values in um, different uh, 3D setups. Uh, but today, uh, what we want to see uh, more in depth is how do we do that in Aurora? Because uh, for, since early uh, 2020, we uh, launched this uh, hyperscan application, which comes uh, installed together with uh, Aurora. Um, until now, uh, what we the main feature of this application was to connect uh, several devices together, um, so we could uh, run the hyperscanning. Uh, into different different subjects, one one device per subject. Um, of course, uh, if we are talking about our needs for two, uh, is, it is our uh, portable and mobile device, which means that we can uh, connect uh, all these uh, subjects uh, independently from each other, just uh, connecting via internal Wi-Fi or an access point to the computer with the hyperscan application. Uh, we can do so with you see here up to uh, five uh, subjects, five five different devices connected simultaneously. And uh, despite of that, we will have one single interface, this application, uh, to uh, check on the status, the uh, visualization, and control of the different uh, subjects. Uh, the data will be fully synchronized, and uh, they will be all, all subjects, all devices will be able to, to receive, um, for example, trigger data uh, simultaneously. So what is new in this 2021.4? Uh, version of Aurora, um, the possibility uh, of having a single device hyperscanning. So starting from this uh, version that was released a few weeks ago, um, we are able to split uh, one single uh, NIST for two in uh, two different uh, subjects. Um, this NIST for two, of course, can connect to the computer as well uh, using uh, the Wi-Fi network. Um, but then, uh, yeah, we can uh, have the, the two different subjects in two different configuration setups, uh, they could be running two different uh, triggers um, yeah, simultaneously. Um, and let's see exactly on step by step before seeing the demo, uh, how do we do that? So before starting this um, hyperscan app, what we, we want to get ready, uh, we want to get one configuration ready. Um, First of all, we would need uh, one montage or more than one if the subjects are going to have different montages uh, on them. For this, we might use Nearsight or we might download uh, a preset montage from our help center. And then with this montage, uh, we want to, to create a new configuration for, um, for the setup we want to prepare. Um, if both subjects have the same um, montage, for example, you'll see in the demo that both of them have a, a headband. Uh, I just need to prepare one configuration in Aurora, so in the as if uh, it were a regular um, uh, recording. But then once the configuration is saved, uh, we can just close Aurora and move to, to the hyperscan application. So we are good to go. Um, so basically, when we uh, launch the hyperscan application, we'll be uh, seeing this window in here, in which uh, we have access to the main dashboard. Um, in this main dashboard, we have uh, we can see enabled two uh, main two, two buttons from the main control. One is uh, to add uh, the subject or add the device, and uh, which is what we are going to use now. But uh, you can also um, load uh, a pre-existing template. So a template is something we can save uh, with our hyperscanning setup. Let's say that uh, we have uh, three different devices that we want to connect. Uh, simultaneously, and we want to split two of these devices between two people and the third device only for one uh, additional subject. So we want to split three devices in five people. Um, instead of every single time that we uh, start our recording, we would need to enter all this information with the serial numbers and all that. What we can do is just to prepare it once, exactly as we want to, to run it with all different configurations that we need. Then we can save this template 
and uh, next time we would only need to to load it here and we'll have already our um devices and subject uh, organization uh ready to ready to be run but by now uh let's say we want to start one from scratch just to prepare for for our demo and uh we would just press at uh, a first subject this will prompt out uh, this subject dialog in which we need to enter, of course, some kind of subject information if we wish. And uh, then we will be able to see in this uh, drop down menu uh, all the devices that uh, the Hyperscan application is detecting. If we are connected to an access point, for example, we'll be able to see as many devices as uh, are configured to this access point. If we don't see uh, anything or we want to keep loading them, we can just press this refresh button and the list will be automatically uh, uploaded, um, yeah, upgraded. Um, after selecting the device, this is the serial number of my device, uh, we can select uh, the configuration that we want to run on this specific subject. So the list that you'll see here is the, the list of all the configurations that are available in Aurora. That's why we had to create our uh, configuration in advance. And uh, then we can select the one we, we had prepared before. So once I have prepared my uh, first subject in my first device, um, we'll, we'll be able to see the subject dashboard. So in here, we can control uh, the, we have control over the subject options specifically. And uh, what we want to see, so we have some um, yeah, subject information in the sub subject menu, but we want to see, um, the subject modifier buttons here. Um, of course, we would be able to uh, already save this template, which is right now it's not much of a template, but just um, this subject with this serial number and this configuration. Um, I could also edit it or delete it. Um, but now what I want to do, uh, instead of uh, what we were used in previous versions of Aurora, which was just to add a second device in here, I want to add a second subject to this same device. So I will be using the add subject button uh, that belongs to the, to the first device. After pressing that, I'm prompted again to the same dialog in which the only difference is that um, the device ID uh, field will be grayed out because of course you want to use the same, um, the same device for, for this subject. But the configuration as you see here might be completely different. So I don't need to use um, mandatorily uh, the two, two, two exact same uh, montages for the same um, device. So I have selected uh, just another configuration I have prepared. And uh, now let's, I have my uh, hyperscan set up uh, ready to go. This is what I wanted to do, one device, two subjects. So here I can uh, press to connect to Aurora. So until now I have been preparing everything in the hyperscan app, but I want to launch uh, different instances of Aurora, one per, per subject, so I I, I'm able to visualize um, the different data components that, that I want to see. Um, so the status of the device or of the whole setup, uh, once I check uh, this connect to Aurora, will go from uh, not connected to initializing, uh, preparing, until uh, we want to see this. We want to see the status of the setup is ready. Um, and on the background, so in the meantime, while this is initializing, um, we'll be able to see how um, the Hyperscan app has launched um, yeah, as many instances as subjects I have. In my case, since I had subject one and subject two, I just have them here. Um, yeah, and by now I'm able to see the, the calibration um, values. So the, what, the only thing that we need to keep in mind, and this is something we would tend to do uh, is as if we are users of um, Aurora in general, is that um, from now on, we don't want to work in Aurora anymore, but we want to control Aurora from the Hyperscan application. Since we want everything to be um, completely synchronized and uh, yeah, recorded at the same time, um, we want to control everything from the same um, uh, software, not, not individually from the different tabs. So, to avoid any uh, mixes, uh, the buttons on, the, on Aurora are um, grayed out um, in contrast of what uh, we would be used to, used to do in, in a regular recording. Um, so it's only because we need to control everything using the Hyperscan app. Um, the way we would do that is just looking at the main dashboard. 
um, in which we have some navigation buttons that allow us to go from the calibration page to the recording page and vice versa. And um, depending on, on which page we are, uh, we can uh, we, we will have different action buttons. So it, we, we will be able to start or stop um, the calibration and or the recording. Um, if we had more devices in, in here, also uh, with different subjects in each of the devices, uh, and let's say we want to just, um, we have run a calibration using these, um, these buttons in the main dashboard. So we run the calibration at the same time for all devices, all subjects, but then for some reason, I want to, to run only the calibration for uh, one of the devices. I can do that uh, instead of using the main dashboard, I can use the subject uh, dashboard. So, uh, but the, the, um, the method will be the same. We would have also navigation buttons and action buttons so we can, can play with that. Um, and finally, just to show you an example. So we did uh, a demo to show all these features. Uh, we were trying to recreate, well, we recreated this paper by uh, Liu et al. Uh, you can see the, the citation here, in which um, we uh, run a, a, a Jenga game between uh, two subjects. In this game, we were studying uh, three different kinds of tasks. Um, the first one uh, was um, constructive uh, interaction, which meant that uh, both subjects had to be talking to each other and playing together, but trying to um, make uh, the other participant um, make a mistake. While uh, then in the second task was more on cooperation, so they also had to talk, but trying to help each other. Um, inside this task, we had one block in which subject one was leading this uh, cooperation, and then uh, the same for subject two. And finally, some kind of parallel play in which both of them were just focusing on their own task and not talking to each other. Um, for this, we used uh, PsychoPy to automatize this uh, process. So we were sending different triggers for later uh, simplify the analysis. Um, as you see here, we were connecting um, from the NISPOR2 to the recording computer, which is on the back. We're connecting completely wireless and also to the PsychoPy computer, which is, um, you might not see it too much in this picture, but it's also not um, connected via any, any hardware. Um, and both subjects uh, were using the headband montage with um, so eight uh, sources, eight detectors, uh, using the um, short distance channels as well in all the sources. So let's uh, see that. One second. Let's see actually the whole um, step by step setup. So, what we have been seeing in this presentation, we will see how we did uh, in exactly. So, um, I started from the point in which I already had prepared my configuration so I can launch the Hyperscan application. Um, as you see, in the meantime, while I prepare this, the subjects can be um, running, uh, putting the, the headbands on and just getting comfortable. I pressed, I wanted to add the first subject with uh, the device serial number that I found uh, in my, in the Wi-Fi connections of my computer. And um, I selected my configuration, which was a headband with uh, short distance detectors. So after um, I can add this first subject, uh, by now, as we said, it's not connected. We are just preparing the setup uh, in the Hyperscan application. Uh, but I have enabled all the, the subject modifier buttons, in which I can edit or delete the subject. Um, I want to add the second subject to this device. So as you see, the device ID is grayed out, but I can select another montage. In this case, I wanted to run exactly the same. Um, so I selected also the headband short distance detectors. I press initializing, and now um, the Hyperscan app is uh, preparing, uh, sorry, is la launching uh, two different instances, as you see now from the back um, of Aurora. In the meantime, the subjects are just getting ready uh, with the Jenga game in the middle. Um, also, my, my PsychoPy paradigm was on the back uh, waiting to, to be run. Um, and as you see here, the two instances were just um, yeah, launched. Um, so I want to prepare them to see the calibration results. Uh, and I pressed the calibrating button uh, for both of them at the at the same time. Uh, yeah, at this moment the subjects 
are quite uh, quiet and we can uh, go to the individual instances of order to check the results. As you see, subject one had uh, one problematic detector, so we had to go and uh, check it, just some kind of uh, removal, cut preparation. And uh, once this was um, solved, we can run the calibration again to make all channels green as subject to already had. And uh, once we see all channels uh, green or at least uh, yellow acceptable, we can um, proceed to, to the recording. So as, as said before, uh, all the controls, everything we want to, to, to run for all the subjects, we have to do from the hyperscan application. But uh, then we use the individual instances of Aurora just for visualization. Uh, if we are interested in any particular um, views, uh, we will still be able to use all the tools that are there for visualization uh, while using um, uh, a regular recording of Aurora. So for example, I can see here the 3D plots. I can uh, go check individual channels if I think uh, that they are um, I don't know, noisy or that we want to see a specific um, activation in some of the channels. In here, we can see the heartbeat. In here, we can see, um, yeah, we can go to the individual channels to, to check um, on signal levels. And yeah, we'll be, we'll be able to see um, all the, the visualization as usual. In here, you see how we, we entered the final um, task, which was just uh, parallel, uh, <clears throat> yeah, parallel play. And uh, both subjects received the trigger at the same uh, timestamp, so at, at the same moment. So the data is, uh, is fully synchronized. And with this, I will leave uh, my epoch to show us uh, some more uh, usage examples. So, uh, right, so in this part, let's take a look at um, some of the nice capabilities that this feature brings. Um, so to, to start with, hyperscanning involves measuring different participants simultaneously, and there, must, there might be significant differences between these participants. So for example, you may have a participant with different hair type. So one participant with dark, dense hair, like me, and other with not so much hair. And we know that scalp, optode contact, and light transmission is affected by hair color, by thickness and density of the hair. So using the same type of optodes um, might not be the optimal solution in this case. In fact, um, just one size fits all approach um, for both the participants or for all the participants in a hyperscanning experiment might not give the best signal quality might not be optimum in terms of setup type, et cetera. So similarly, if we consider an uh, infant adult diet, there's a higher need of comfort for the infant participant as compared to an adult participant. And the NEOSPO2 now allows you to choose optodes specific to the participant. So you can choose, for example, we have extra comfortable blunt tip optodes for infants which are well tolerated, and dual tip optodes for adults that provide excellent, excellent signal quality. So within a single device, you are able to pick optodes which are most suitable for that specific participant. Um, one other feature that we have implemented is montage mixing. So um, though most hyperscanning studies measure the same region, the same brain region in participants, in some cases, you might want to measure different brain regions of interest between the participants. So in this case, for example, um, this is a classroom study where uh, the group measured interaction between a student um, and, a, and a teacher, and they measured different brain ROIs. For the student, they measured the prefrontal cortex. For the teacher, they measured the TPJ and uh, the the device now allows you to pick different montages um, for different participants. To summarize all this, uh, we have a short video that I would like to share. And let me play that and Blanca, if you can confirm that I'm playing the right video. 
Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So in this video, you already noticed that uh, the female participant, who is my teammate, Amy, um, can be considered as an easy participant simply because of her hair type and skin tone. Um, and even if the optodes, which you will see now, even if the optodes are placed on the motor region, which generally has a lot of hair, the signal quality is almost always very good for such participants with minimal uh, preparation and most standard solutions work quite well. On the other hand, on the right side, um, there's my teammate Dimitri and simply because of his dark, dense hair um, and the optodes on the temporal parietal region uh, would be slightly challenging to set up. So for, for Dimitri, um, since we might need to remove the hair from underneath the optodes, um, if there's a need for faster setup, and then we can use something like avalanche photodiodes in this case, which are eight times more sensitive than our standard um, silicon photodiode detector. So here's, here again, the ability to choose participant specific optodes or participant specific solution can help in um, getting really good signal quality. So let me. <laughs> So as I said, Amy had the cap on motor region and Dimitri had the cap on the temporoparietal region. Um, so just, just to summarize this video again, um, for, for, the, for the easy participant, um, well, it's a relatively easy participant, we didn't need to use any special um, optodes. Uh, we use our standard dual tip optodes, which work wonderfully well. Uh, for Dimitri, we wanted to have a, have a faster setup. And in those cases, um, we could use avalanche photodiodes, which are highly sensitive, reduce the signal, uh, reduce the setup time and give uh, excellent signal quality right away. So that's it for this webinar. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience and we'll try to answer as many as possible. Uh, if you're not able to reach your questions uh, due to time constraints, then we will get back to you offline. And you can always write to us as well. So I'll pull up the sheet and we'll start with the questions. The first question is, um, can hyperscanning also be conducted with the previous version of Neosport, which was the Neosport one? Um, it can indeed be, be done. Uh, using the previous device, but single device hyperscanning is not possible with, with that device. It's simply because the eight sources, eight detectors in a new sport one are just not enough to split between two participants. So in that case, if you have two near sport one devices, then hyperscanning can be set up. And the near star software, which runs the near sport one device already has this built-in function, which you would need two devices. Um, then Blanca, we already, you already talked about this point. Will there be another webinar addressing data analysis of hyperscanning? Mm -hmm. Yes, we are still uh, checking some options to use, for example, the, the nearest toolbox, um, mm -hmm. but we will run a, a webinar on this in, in the upcoming months. Okay, for, for my curiosity, is any of the existing platforms already built to do hyperscanning analysis? Yes, the NEARS toolbox uh, has a hyperscanning package. And um, as I said, uh, we have a guide on functional connectivity on our help center that uh, might explain a bit better, like all the modules, what do they do exactly? Um, mm -hmm. And also the toolbox includes a, a demo, like a script demo on running each of them. But for more, um, yeah, usage cases or more information, we might check on this webinar. Okay, wonderful. Um, then someone is asking, what is the maximum number of participants that can be measured with the near score two? So at the moment, we are comfortable measuring um, ten participants. So we we are able to connect five near score two devices together, and that means that if you use this single device hyperscanning feature we can synchronize data and even markers from 
10 participants simultaneously. Right. Um, in those cases, I must say that um, maybe, um, maybe a computer with slightly higher processing power might be needed. Okay. Also, a simple question is the connection between PC and the Y and the device wireless. Um, so indeed, you can have a wireless connection. You can also have USB connection. And even with with um, if you use the Neosport 2 for a single participant, um, and if you have multiple participants, each connected with a single Neosport 2 device, then you, you are able to actually synchronize the data wirelessly. So if the paradigm involves movement, I have never, I've never seen a hyperscanning paradigm which involves movement, but if yours does, then I think that's also possible. Um, next question, how many sources and detectors can we use for one subject? If our NSP2 has eight sources and eight detectors, can we use four, four? Uh, for each subject, Blanca. So unfortunately, not right now. Um, mm -hmm. Now uh, we can split uh, one news for two into subjects that use a maximum of eight eight uh, configuration. So one of the subjects could indeed uh, have, a, let's say, an eight four motor montage, for example. But mm -hmm. we cannot split the same bundle into additional subjects right, right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, we have another question on the setup. Can you have two eight eight with different sampling rates? So, yes. So since uh, the sampling rate is something you configure in the in the configuration, so what we were saying that you have to have prepared in advance before going mm -hmm. to the hyperscan app, you can mm -hmm. select different configurations for um, the different subjects and then mm -hmm. have different sampling rates. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the nice part about this hyperscanning, single device hyperscanning uh, app is you can actually have really high sampling rate because very briefly, um, sampling rate is is um, determined by how many sources you are using. So since we we activate sources one by one, something called time multiplexing. So with the Neosport 2, we have about 160 Hertz of sampling rate overall. And when we use 16 sources, we get about 10 Hertz per uh, per channel, let's say. Um, and the restriction is um, we have to prevent crosstalk between between the optodes. And when the optodes are split between two participants, they are actually far enough, and we don't expect any crosstalk. So in those cases, the sampling rate could be actually very high. Uh, I think 20 Hertz or so should be possible. Okay, um, then we have uh, one more question. Uh, let me try to understand this. I'm not sure whether I understand it fully. Um, right, how does the system adjust source intensity for different participants? For example, in a parent-child experiment, Rephrase, can we run parent-child experiment in a single device? So I think that's that's a really, uh, really good question. Um, so and we take the example of um, the paper I showed where uh, we had an infant, where we had an adult, and the soft, software, what it does is it, um, it adjusts the source intensity for different participants. So imagine if we didn't have that, if we had only single source intensity for all the optodes, for all the sources, um, then what will happen is um, the software will, will, let's say, run a signal optimization, and it will notice that at a certain um, source intensity, the signal is not good enough for the adult. So it will try to increase the source intensity to get good signal for an adult participant. That same intensity might saturate the detectors in an infant, simply because most infants don't have so much hair. The skull um, thickness is different. So light passes through an infant skull more easily. So what you need is you need to have 
sources that can adjust intensity based on the participant they are on. So for an adult, uh, we should be able to use higher intensity because of hair, skull thickness, etc. And for an infant, we should be able to use lower intensity um, in order to prevent saturation. And the Neosport 2 does that very well. It does optimize. It looks at the signal feedback uh, during the signal optimization and then chooses optimum intensity for that particular participant. So we don't saturate the detectors in the infant and get really good signal quality in an adult participant. So, and um, then having the option of choosing participant specific optodes, uh, this blunt tip comfortable optodes for the infant and dual tip optodes for, for, for an adult um, combined with this individual adjustment of source intensity um, helps in reducing the, the setup time significantly and also provides excellent signal quality in both type of participants. Um, and I think that's it for the questions. Uh, if we have missed your questions, do forgive us and do write to us. Um, we will get back to you offline. I, I hope you enjoyed this webinar. If you have any questions, um, uh, as I said, please write to us, to our support team. This webinar will be uploaded on our, on our website. And uh, that's it from us. We'll see you next time.